spent a lot of my day thinking about security problems, thinking about ways that people can break into security systems, circumvent controls. I also think about, a lot about how people can defend against security issues. What I often don't spend a lot of time thinking about is my own personal privacy. Like many of you, I have vast amounts of information about myself available online. My, my doctor has information online about me. I bank online, I shop online. And even in the physical world, when I walk from my home to work, there are closed circuit television sets, television cameras all over the place, seeing what I'm doing. Many of those, in some parts of the world, actually have facial recognition. And even beyond that, if you really think about the way where all information is being stored about us, in my profession, I come to the realization that someone or something will always fail at protecting my private and sensitive information. And when I thought about that, I wanted to think about where in the world can I store information or keep information that no one could get at, where it will be 100% privacy. And when I thought about that, the one thing that came to mind was my mind. Now, in the world we live in today, I can think about any idea I want. I can form any opinion that I want. But until I decide to speak or share that information, it's mine. No one can get at it. Now, we're here today in some place that depicts and looks like a church. If I was to stop for a couple of seconds and say a prayer, and then ask all of you in the audience to think of the answer to the following question, who heard my prayer? Now, some of you who are in the audience might obviously say, well, God did. God heard your prayer. But then others may say, well, I'm not very religious. I'm not one who believes in God, so nobody heard your prayer. And in reality, in the year 2012, both of those answers are correct depending on what you believe in. No one in this room, no one in this city, no one in this country, even on this planet, could actually have heard my prayers. But I believe that's about to change. Now, I've always been a bit of a hacker. Even when I was growing up, when I was three or four years old, I wanted to push every single button I can get my hands on and turn every single dial. I broke a lot of things in the process, but it wasn't until I was about six years old that I got my hands on my first computer. I remember sitting on the floor of my parents' kitchen looking at the funnies. I had a piece of silly putty in my hand and I was rolling it up and pushing it onto the faces of the family circus characters, pulling it off and stretching them every which way. I then remember glancing over at a sheet of paper on the next page and there was an advertisement. Being six years old, I couldn't really read much, but I was able to read free computer in that advertisement. And I don't really remember the negotiations that took place between myself and my parents, but just a short time later, myself, my sister and my mom and my dad were off going to attend a timeshare seminar. <laughs> and after they placed us off into a kid's play area, my parents had to sit through a three-hour timeshare seminar. And afterwards, they handed my parents a voucher, and we walked over to a table. I remember handing the voucher to a woman at a table. She turned around and picked up a box and handed it to me. And on that box was a photo of a computer. We rushed home, plugged it into our television set in our living room, and I remember sitting down learning to program. I followed every single program that was in the thick instruction manual that came with it. And at the end of a couple of years, I exhausted all of those programs and started to write my own. Now, there's a lot of activities that took place between then and now, where I'm standing here today at age 37, where today I run a global team of hackers. We hack into banks to try to steal information. We hack into video game systems to try to disrupt the play. We've even hacked into online gambling systems to try to get everybody else to, to fold and for us to take all the, all, the way, all the winnings. But we're not criminals. We actually do this on behalf of those companies in order to help them better the security of their systems. Now, in the world we live in, there are criminals who try to hack into systems to steal your personal and private information. And there's also industrial espionage and cyber armies that are gearing up today to try to get access to intellectual property or other information. And all of those organizations, including my organization, always gravitate towards, towards something called a zero day. Now, that may be a term that you're not familiar with, and so let me help describe what a zero day is. About a year and a half ago, a colleague and I named Paul Kerr were doing research, security research. We acquired a bunch of different mobile devices. We set them up in our lab and started running them through a whole series of tests. What we wanted to see is that when a mobile device was communicating to an endpoint, over a secure channel, could we intercept that, that data? Now, if you think of the example of you pull your iPhone out of your pocket and you tap on your, your online banking application, your online banking application is connecting up to your bank. 
Now, the way things work is that that's encrypted. That data, your username and password, your bank account details, your balance transfers that you're performing, all of that is being encrypted. Well, through our research, we actually discovered a flaw in iOS, which is the operating system that runs on iPhones and iPads, that allowed us to sit between an iPhone and the online banking system and actually intercept that data. Now, it was a critical enough vulnerability that we went off and, and told Apple about it. We reported it to them. And unlike a lot of companies, when we report security vulnerabilities, they didn't sit on it for 30 days or 90 days or a year. They actually went and fixed the problem within 10 business days. Within 10 days, 150 million people around the world saw an update in iTunes that said there's a new version of iOS that's ready to be installed. But during that 10-day period, we knew about the problem, Apple knew about the problem, and if we, didn't, if we, had, if we had male intent with that, with that knowledge, we can go out into the wild, go in coffee shops, go to libraries, go into, the, go into public Wi-Fi systems, and basically intercept all the traffic, all the encrypted traffic, as it flowed between a mobile device and its intended recipient. Now, that's what a zero day is. It's a vulnerability that has no known fix. During that 10-day period, no one could fix this problem if we were to go out and try to attack people with it. Now, those zero days are actually very dangerous when they're discovered, and they're also very valuable. There are organizations out there, vulnerability brokers, or even governments, that'll pay researchers tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their hands on a vulnerability like that because they know they can use it to attack people or attack organizations, and there'll be no defense against that problem. Now, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about brains. Now, when I was eight years old, I had a little bit of a medical condition. It really didn't bother me much, but it scared the hell out of my parents and my teachers. Uh, basically, if I was to get hurt or get into a very stressful situation, I would pass out. And it was perceived that I was actually having a seizure. So my parents took me to some hospitals. Um, basically, one of the tests they had to run was an electroencephalogram, an EEG. I remember sitting down in the chair and having a technician placing electrodes all over the surface of my head. And he explained to me what was going on. Being eight years old, I was really confused. I thought it was kind of cool that I had electrodes coming out of my head, um, but I really didn't understand what this was all about. So when he explained it to me, he said, your brain is like a computer. It's electrical. There's, there's circuits running around in your brain, even though they're made of cells. But we're going to, through this test, we're going to see what your brain is doing. We're going to have you go to sleep for a few hours. And at the end of that, if there is, when we do some analysis, if there's a glitch or a bug in your programming, um, we may be able to help fix and cause you, from, cause you to stop having these seizures. Well, I didn't really think much about that since that time until a couple of months ago. I started to notice online that you can go out and purchase EEG, EEG devices for yourself. Now, they're not for medical reasons. They're actually for novelty, for entertainment purposes, or even, even trying to help people concentrate. You can go buy these devices. They're a couple of hundred dollars. You put them on your head, and then you pair it up with your iPad or your iPhone and start downloading games that are, that are designed to play with those. You can control things on those games. You could, you could make things move around on the screen. And I thought that was really rather interesting. But research is even going further along, along this path. Now, for me, one of my greatest fears would be to not be able to communicate, not be able to speak, not be able to share my ideas and opinions, um, maybe typing on a keyboard or writing. Maybe I am in, a car, I'm in an accident or I suffer a disease where I'm not able to do that. I'm able to see, hear, smell, taste, and not be able to communicate with everybody in this room. Fortunately for people that are going through that or have that unfortunate circumstance, there's wonderful research going on today. There's universities around the world that are trying to develop a mind-computer interface. And they're not doing it with million-dollar equipment. They're actually going out and purchasing these consumer-grade EEG devices and hooking them up to systems and doing analysis of people's brainwaves to try to obtain information from their, from their mind. Now, we're still at the early stages of this, but some of the results have been rather promising. There's been studies that have been going on that they're able to convert thought to text with around 80% accuracy. They're able to extract things like social security numbers or credit card numbers out of people's minds. Now, if you think about where all this technology will be going, um, eventually this will be perfected for the, for the medical community. People who need this technology will be able to place one of these devices upon their head, and it will change their lives. They'll be able, now be able to communicate with people around them. 
And then after maybe a couple of years, when after this is perfected in, in, in the medical world, people like me, someone who's a hacker or a hobbyist, will decide to get our hands on some of this technology and, and wear it in our, in our labs. We might want to sit back and move our mouse around using our minds or not have to actually type an email. We just think what that email should be, and out on the screen comes, this, comes our text. Now, after some hobbyists start playing around with it, eventually um, we'll find that maybe there will be some professions or some jobs where this technology will help people be more accurate or be more efficient. So things that you need to use your hands with in order to do your job, you actually can use your mind as well at the same time and give yourself an extra ability. Now, these might become standard issue for employers. Here you go, here's your computer, here's your cell phone, and here's your EEG device that you need to wear every day. So thinking beyond that, the people who use this every day at work that are used to using these devices may say, well, I'm going to take these things home. They can make my life pretty interesting. I can walk into my house and turn my lights on when I want. I can adjust my thermostat. I can sit on my couch and change the channels with my mind. I may even be able to go and do a Google search. Think of some term that you want to search for and have that information displayed back into, in front of me using some augmented reality. Or maybe I have a, a little speaker embedded in my ear, so when I'm communicating with things, I actually can get feedback and actually can, I can hear the results or have them speak the text of what I'm looking to do. Now, even beyond that, over time, maybe a couple decades later, there'll be people in the upper echelons of society that will say, you know, I think it looks rather silly, you know, walking around with one of these caps in or how it's blinking lights. You kind of look like an idiot. So maybe we'll go and I'm going to go to a surgeon and say, here's a lot of money. Can you embed that into my head? Can you do some surgery and embed those, those, those sensors into my head so I can walk around, have my hair look however I want, and actually be able to interact with this technology in the everyday world very casually, without even having to think about it? Now, if you, if you think about where this is going, um, there's some dark sides to this as well. There may be different ways, as, as me, as a security person, as an ethical hacker, I can think of ways that we possibly can attack people through this technology. Now let's think about the situation where um, this technology is adopted and it's at the height of its use. It's the year 2052. We have people, millions of people all over the world are using this to go about their everyday lives. When they want to walk in and, and go someplace, they sit down in their, in their car and they basically just think about where they want to go and off the car takes them. If they want to send a message to, to, to their loved, one of their loved ones, their wife, their kids, they basically just think about sending them that message and that message is converted from their mind into technology, sent along, and then someone receives that information without having to f open up your phone and, and fumble and type something in. Now imagine in the 20, year 2052, there's a security researcher, someone like me, who goes and acquires all of this technology. I set it up in a lab and I start running tests. Presumably this mind computer interface was designed with some security controls in place, hopefully because it's adopted by millions of people around the world, but say I want to test those security controls. I now start running a series of tests. I might spend days, weeks, even years looking for a hole in this technology. And then one day I find it. I find that I have the ability to build a device and I can go out into the public world and actually point this device at somebody and see their thoughts. Now, immediately as a security researcher, the first reaction is I need to tell the manufacturer about this problem. I need to be able to send the information to them so they can fix it, so they can patch millions of people's minds around the world. But I don't. I think about this and say, there's a great deal of power in having this zero-day vulnerability in my hands. I could use it in my workplace. I could use it in my personal life. I could use it in the, in the outside world, in society, to give myself an extra level of skill above everybody else. Before, if someone has an idea about something, I'll be able to see that before they actually say it. But one day, I decide to share this information with somebody else. I just don't keep it for myself. I have a friend, I say, hey, come on over, I gotta show you something. And then that person tells somebody else. And eventually it gets out. It makes all over the headlines, it makes world news that the mind computer interface that everybody has in their possession has a security flaw. And somebody can read your thoughts. Now this could get even a little more sinister, and you sort of turn the, the dark dial a little bit to the right. Imagine the year 2102, where this technology is not just for people who can afford it, but it's made available to everybody in the world. 
You now have a dictatorship, an evil regime, and the dictator's a little bit tired of worrying about people jumping through the window trying to kill him. They're tired of having mobs of people rushing the palace and trying to knock things down and, and disrupt um, th the country's order. So this dictator decides to pass a law that says every single person in his country has to have one of these devices embedded in their head. After the operation is done, this dictator can now sit back and relax because they know that if a mob of people decide to organize someplace far away and have thoughts about killing the dictator, he could preempt that and have them removed from society. If someone's going to try to plot and plan to blow up his motorcade as he's driving through the, through the, through the towns, they'll know about it and they can remove them from society. Now there's also religious implications to all of this. If we think about and we go back to the church that we were talking about earlier. Now this isn't the church of the year 2012, this is the church of the year 2052. And the congregation is just coming into the church on a Sunday morning after having read the headlines that the mind computer interface has a security flaw. Many of the people in this church actually have those. Some of the people actually have them embedded in their heads and they use them as part of their everyday lives. Now you think, when this news breaks, that most people would remove those devices, throw them in the trash, call up their doctor and say, please remove it from my brain. I don't want to deal with this anymore. Some maybe do, but most probably won't. If you think about the world we live in today, mobile devices, everybody in this room probably has a mobile device in their pocket. If you knew that there was a security flaw in it and, and one of the manufacturers wasn't going to be able to fix it for a couple of weeks, would you turn off that device and stick it in a drawer and not use it for two weeks? Probably not. So now this congregation is sitting here. They're, they're talking with each other. They're getting ready to pray. And they're no longer thinking about who's hearing our prayers. They're no longer thinking about the answer to that question. What they're thinking about is who else can hear their prayers. There's the unknown factor. When they're praying for something important or for, for a great achievement or they're, or they're or confessing something horrible that they did, someone may be able to listen in and hear that. So now what they're worried about and it's going through their minds is not who hears their prayers, but who will answer them. Thank you for listening. <laughs>